thing that you know we ask we need to ask developers and may, we have many many more apis that will be there for business and so it's important now to understand what's the the stack what's enable what enables to build apis and to manage apis and and actually what's the complete software supply chain all the way down and this is why uh, uh after uh, this talk we wanted to have eric uh, newcomer a cto of wso2 who will tell us a little bit hello eric how are you Hey, good, thanks. How are you? Wow, what a great talk. That Jeff guy is really enthusiastic and got a lot of good points. Yes, and we have you right after to keep the level. Uh, of, oh, wow. Yeah, I don't know if I can be that enthusiastic, but I, you know, I'll try to try my best. And it really is an honor to, to follow him. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us. And thank as you said, I will try to talk about the next step on this and how do you build things and what's the right way to look at building things to get all those advantages Jeff was just talking about in the cloud, trusting up all the time, scaling, avoiding those spikes, uh, all these kind of things we, we got to think about when we're building our APIs. This is exactly why we have you now. I invite you to share uh, what you want to share with us and I'll let you with the community. It's an honor to have you, Eric, thank you. Thank you very much for a great introduction and hello everybody. I'm Eric Newcomer, CTO at WSO2. Really honored to follow Jeff, honored to be here at API Days. And now I want to follow up on some of the things he said around uh, building it. You know, in particular, what is the right environment for, for building things uh, today? And Jeff touched on this when he started talking about the cloud. So I want to get into that a little bit. Uh, just, uh, hello, you know, this is me. Been at WSO2 since November. Before that, I was in financial services for about 10 years. Before that, was in technology companies for another 25 years. For me, it's kind of back to the future, coming back to technology. And I'm really glad to be back here in the technology area to help WSO2 go to the next level of significant growth with our next generation of uh, products. So what I want to talk about is the context of building. And software, of course, has to run somewhere on hardware. And we always have to kind of keep that in mind when we're building software, if we want to make sure that software runs the way we expect it to do and has all those great characteristics of scalability availability, reliability, and agility, uh, many of which Jeff were just, was just talking about. So that's just a little bit of a compare and contrast to talk about how things have evolved and how we should think about how things have evolved in the context of what we're building and how we want to build it when we want to create our great APIs. So this picture, UNIVAC, one of the first computers ever built for commercial use, is a mainframe. And in those days, you can see people went into the room to use the computer to run the program to get the results. And now with a modern data center built on PC hardware, commodity hardware and with uh, open source software and all kinds of things being deployed on it, this is what you see. And you're never gonna be let into this place, right? If you've seen any of the videos and there are many out there on YouTube, if you haven't seen them, I encourage you to go watch them about tours of data centers because you can't get in there. They post videos of it and you therefore have no idea where uh, your program is running, which computer it's running on, and really uh, that shouldn't matter to you uh, anymore. In the old days, of course, the computer was in the room, you went to the computer, you did your work, and now the computers are in data centers around the world, and when you upload your programs, your microservices, your containers to run, you're having something that's selecting where those things, where those things run for you, and you really don't know and you don't want to know. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, just a little brief notes on this. As I mentioned, sometimes uh, uh, there's some value in talking about evolution and the point of the evolution I want to talk about and which we'll get to is why by now Kubernetes is mature enough, why the cloud, I should say, is mature enough so that we know Kubernetes is something as a solid, solid foundation to build on for our APIs and our programs and our microservices. And it's just a, a part of it. The point of it is that computing has evolved from the mainframe when you knew where the, where the computer was and you had one application for a computer. You weren't thinking about networking things and things evolved starting about 20, 21 years ago when Google invented the commodity data center. Uh, and you can see the original server in the computing museum if you want to see that. And they changed it basically to operate more on the web scale. And Jeff was talking about this. You used to have spikes, you used to have capacity problems, you used to not be able to trust your computers and your programs to be up all the time. 
And one of the things that, that Google invented with the data center rewrite, rewrite was to make sure that, that if you're going to have a computer fail, that the system can tolerate it. This was the biggest change and it's the biggest assumption on which cloud native computing is built, built up over these 21 years. And therefore, networking has become essential. You run multiple copies of the program, multiple copies of the data. If something fails, something is there to take over and keep running. But this means you have to do things a little differently. You have to create highly networked, highly distributed applications and APIs. And to make that successful, you need to break the work up so it can be deployed on those small computers and run in a way which is resilient and performant and scalable. We started out uh, with this journey onto microservices, containers, and Kubernetes. From my point of view, at least, the first I became aware of it was when Netflix was moving their mainframe, uh, sorry, their mainframe, their Java EE application from monolith to microservices. At that point, they developed their own containers uh, Canyon, Governator, and they had Spinnaker for delivery of them. So they created some of solutions to these problems for themselves of how do you break up the work correctly for deployment of these kind of data centers to get all these advantages of scale and availability and reliability. How do you deploy it? How do you create containers? And how do you orchestrate them? But since then, standards have come along. Docker has become the approved industry standard, accepted industry standard for containers. And the next level problem after that was how do you orchestrate those containers? And Kubernetes has become the standard for that. And now that we have got to that point, I think we have solved the main problems of how you break up your program that you're going to run that provides your API functionality. How are you going to containerize it so you can run it anywhere in the data center in the cloud? And how are you going to configure it using Kubernetes for that deployment that includes the reliability, the agility, and the cost. These are all trade-offs, different assumptions, and reinvention of the stack. But by now, we've gone through the major evolutionary aspects of this to get to the point where we can run things in the new environment the way we want to run them. And that's basically what's resulted in the Kubernetes, uh, as a result of the Kubernetes standardization. And we can build on this. OK, so what does it mean? Just give us the containers. We'll figure out where to run them. That's how it's done now. Get the code into containers that runs the APIs, executes the APIs, deploy them in the cloud to get all those benefits. Uh, Jeff was talking about that I mentioned earlier on agility scale. And one of the biggest things when we uh, you know, talk to customers who we can make the journey to the cloud is the agility of being able to automatically deploy small units of work represented by microservices and containers and to iterate them at the speed in which Jeff was talking about that you want to get that feedback loop going. You put something out there, you get the prototype out there, you get the feedback loop, and you start to discover problems that customers have that are uncovered through this process of agility and iteration. And that's one of the biggest values of moving to containers and, orchest and the orchestration of them. Just an interesting side note, by the way, speaking about containers, if you want to get your own data center or a temporary data center, let's say that something goes down or it's an outage, you need to add capacity, you can actually order the data center in a container. So it's just kind of a funny side note. You can have your containers deployed in containers uh, if you want. All right, anyway, so back to the point about Kubernetes, standardizing container orchestration for cloud native computing so we can get all those benefits of, of cloud native computing. And this is telling us how and where to run all the containerized programs. So you get your code in containers, and then you work with Kubernetes through the UI or the CLI and it deploys them out there into those cloud, cloud uh, data centers. And these, of course, can be data centers from any cloud provider, a public cloud provider, or even a private cloud. And the main point here is we've got this function here, this workload of, of uh, sorry, this way of taking the workloads from the control, uh, from control plane point of view, spreading them out under across different clusters and pods within those clusters, and, fi and finally giving some qualities of service to them so that you might have load balance, you might have scalability, you might have reliability and start new containers if others fail. So Kubernetes is providing a lot of value for these kinds of cloud workloads so you can get the, the value and the benefits of moving to the cloud. Looks pretty easy, right? What could go wrong? Well, that's the whole point. If something goes wrong with a Kubernetes deployment, it can be very hard to fix, very hard to find out. This is the Kubernetes uh, troubleshooting guide that you can get from the kubernetes.io 
uh, learn kubernetes.io uh, website and basically it just gives you the flow chart of all the things that you need to check and maybe fix if something goes wrong in kubernetes environment okay so normally if you're somebody like uber or amazon or some of the you know the companies jeff mentioned that everybody wants to be like in terms of a digital con co company support the transformation avoid being disrupted you need to find a way to deal with this you would like to have though uh, an sre team that does this site reliable engineering to set all this up so your developers don't have to worry about it and they just just hand off their containers the config files for kubernetes and then the rest of it is kind of magic but it may not always be that easy the developers are still involved in the touch point with the sre team even if you have one if you don't have one you have the complexity of how to get that going uh, if you're just trying to deploy and provision kubernetes in a public cloud you've got some complications how to set that up who's doing that how can you make it easy for developers to avoid any of these complexities well we're assuming Kubernetes now, right? We've got to the point of the evolution of cloud native computing, where, computer, where Kubernetes has become the standard for deploying containers. Docker has become the standard for those containers. And we can see at the bottom of this slide, many versions of Kubernetes available out there from all the cloud providers have their own version. There's public on-prem versions from OpenShift and Rancher and Nomad and you know all kinds of people have kubernetes they all have slightly different flavors and they are of course competing with each other for having different capabilities that will get you to buy OpenShift versus no matter rancher or deploy an aws or google however they have enough in common so we can start to look at abstractions across these flavors of kubernetes and work at the next level up and this is i think something very important for us at the industry level now is that because we're able to assume Kubernetes is going to be the deployment for the containers and Docker will be the containers, we can start to build on that. I've seen a lot of text in the industry saying Kubernetes is a platform. Yes, it is. Is Kubernetes the new app server? I'm not sure. It's more of an orchestrator, but still in the sense that this is the way you deploy applications now, yes, it, it is. And I, my observation is that we've gotten to a point of maturity in the cloud native industry where Kubernetes is becoming that de facto standard platform, we can start to assume is going to be there and therefore get to the next level and add the value services on top of, of, of Kubernetes. So what does that mean for, for APIs? You can create a, a platform for developing and deploying APIs onto Kubernetes and be confident that this is going to work wherever you need to deploy it. Furthermore, if you take another step and say, let's look at the code that we're creating, whether it's through a no code abstraction, a low code abstraction or full code and have within that code, the attributes and the metadata needed to create Docker files and Kubernetes configs, you can automate the whole thing without the developers having to worry about it, including the publication and consumption of the APIs that you're building. This is a, this is a very, uh, very important point that now we've gotten to standardization of containers and orchestration, we can embed within the code on our development platforms, the metadata and the characteristics that we need to extract from that to build on those standards, because we know we can assume they're going to be there. We don't have to worry about what platform is it going to go on? What orchestration is going to happen? What containers are we going to use? We know it's going to be Docker. We know it's going to be Kubernetes. And we know that we can start to abstract a top of Kubernetes to make sure this is all going to work correctly, no matter which flavor of Kubernetes you're, you're using. So dev, make sure you have included in that the metadata that you need. This is your handoff to your SRE team. It's in the code. Ops takes it, builds the pipeline, automatically build, test, deploy, including the API. Uh, and this is possible because we know it can all be done with Docker and Kubernetes. Okay, so just to complete the picture, uh, you want to be able to have these platforms on Kubernetes for APIs. You want to be able to input from with your solution architecture and your domain-driven design, do integration uh, code and APIs with low code, full code, create microservices with APIs, put it through the pipeline, deploy onto Kubernetes, publish into the API marketplace, consume from the API marketplace, and you have the platform for APIs that need that allow you to build 
these great digital solutions that uh, Jeff talked about on the amazing infrastructure that he also mentioned that you need to make these APIs world-class, trustable, performance, scalable, and agile. Okay, evolution of API platforms based on the maturity of Kubernetes is gonna take us to the next level. Evolution of computing from all the way from one machine to hundreds and thousands of machines for deployment clearly points to Kubernetes as a lasting platform. Okay, everybody always says until something else comes along. Sure, but people said that about web services 20 years ago. People always say that, whatever the new trend is. But my point is that I can see from the evolution of the computing industry from way back until this point that certain things get to a certain point of maturity because they're solving a certain set of problems. In this case, Kubernetes is solving this distributed application deployment problem onto cloud native software and infrastructure, which is a problem that's been there in evolution for the last 10, uh, 20 years, waiting to be solved and various markers have been put along the way around Netflix, Docker standardization, Kubernetes standardization. This is going to be with us for a while. You can see this as well by the fact that everybody is starting to adopt it. Everybody's starting to invest. There's so many versions out there. The industry has really achieved a kind of consensus on something that's going to be there for a long time. Well, something else would come along, sure, but 20 years ago, when we were working on getting web services established, they said the same thing, but we still have it around even though, yes, something else has come along. But Kubernetes, the main point, is gonna be there for a long time. We can, it's been standardized on now, we can assume it. And sorry, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, Meso, Swarm, et cetera, Kubernetes is the standard that we're going to build on, it's the platform, it's the environment with, you know, on which we're going to de deliver those great APIs for building those competitive, differentiable digital experiences with all those great capabilities of the cloud around agility and scale and reliability. And now that we know Kubernetes will be there for our containers, we can develop and auto deploy our APIs with complete confidence. Okay, thanks. That will do it for, for me. On my presentation, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. I don't know if we have time for them now. If not, certainly I'll be at the uh, available through WSO2 booth or through any other channels. Yeah, we have a we have five minutes for uh, for question. Thank you very much, yeah, Eric. Great. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Eric. Uh, one question about like the, the new API stack. So you talk Docker, you say the Kubernetes. We also have the open API specification that helps also on the more the front the front side to happen. Like how today a, a top manager can like find his navigates into all of this. Of course, you explained the, uh, the, 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 the Kubernetes part and everything, but what advice you would give to a, 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 an API manager? Sure, I think we can start with the open API spec. We can start with the async API spec. We can start with looking at what is the uh, business problem the API is going to solve. I think Jeff talked about this as well, where you want to make sure that whatever API you're building, you're not just exposing the technology that you have, but you're providing the service the customer is looking for uh, within that part of the API. If you think about digital applications, all of them depend on great APIs to connect to the back ends for data and you want to make sure that those connections are there, that it's instant, that's fast, it's performable. That's why we're talking about Kubernetes and cloud native because you want this all to be very fast, scalable, always up, uh, agile. But the main point for those APIs is they need to provide the business function that those, uh, those digital applications are, are delivering to the customers. Classic example of Uber, you have the map on Google Map with the Google APIs. You've got this great interactive experience with the customers to show where the cars are, doing all the transactions. All of these things rely on those APIs underneath. And when you're designing APIs, you want to make sure they're fitting in to that kind of ecosystem to provide that value for customers. Uh, one question about open source. Uh, WSO2 has been a leader in the API management space and especially being open source. Uh, that's that's an important aspect. Uh, you talked about Docker, you talked about Kubernetes, which are also open source technologies. Like how to think today, how, what advice you would give about thinking the open source into, let's say, the new inf API infrastructure stack? Open source is, is, is going to remain important. Open source dynamics in the industry have changed with the adoption of cloud and cloud providers providing services uh, based on open source products. So we have to rethink a little bit uh, the value of open source in the context of the cloud, especially in the public cloud. 
Uh, you want to make sure that all of your APIs are open, all of the source that you use for your development is open, and you want to make sure to protect yourself against any um, anything that might happen with what you're doing by being able to continue to use the source code publicly in GitOps and, and GitHub and so on. Uh, you want to make sure you take advantage of the open source capabilities all along the way, even though the cloud is putting us more in a software as a service model, all of the artifacts should still be should be open source that are either consumed or produced. Yeah, and uh, on one slide, uh, one question about DevOps. Uh, on one slide, you showed that you know there are some Dev tools and Ops tools, and actually the DevOps culture can make uh, a sense out of it. How would you uh, convince today company to adopt, let's say, the DevOps culture and the DevOps tooling chain? Uh, tool chain, uh, like um, uh, to uh, to be sure they can they can deploy and software as fast as needed by the the market. It's a tough question, and we really struggled with this uh, quite a bit when I was at, at City. My biggest advice would be to think about the culture change in the, in con constructing the teams that are working on these APIs. Uh, I think that there's a famous memo, of course, from Jeff Bezos years ago about services. It was a lot of work Netflix did and and Amazon has done as well on creating small two pizza teams, autonomous teams, where you have everybody in, involved, whether it's ops or devs or people talking uh, responsibility for data, for infrastructure. You want to get everybody in, in the same room on the same team and have them work it all out t together. I think uh, if you just say, this is my responsibility to develop the code, this is my responsibility to deploy the code as an operator, then you end up with this uh, almost the same kind of a wall that you have between the customer and developer that Jeff was talking about breaking down. You want to make sure any of those barriers are broken down between development and ops, and everybody's on the same team, using the same tools, understanding how everything should be done, and making it a seamless experience rather than dividing the work up. You don't want, you don't want to have those barriers from, hey, I'm going to throw my code over the wall and you're going to test and deploy it, because that really inhibits agility. So last question that we have. Uh, so we had Docker, uh, you know, the, the container. We had the Kubernetes, the orchestration. What's next? What's the next big thing? <laughs> Everybody always asks that. But I think serverless is the next big thing uh, for sure. I see, I see a big trend for people using step functions. And it's not to say you, you, you can't use Docker with, with serverless or you can't use microservices with serverless. Of course you can, but I think people are going to start looking at step functions to build applications uh, and more than they have been in the past. I, you know, another big thing people talk about is edge computing, but we certainly are seeing evolution of Kubernetes and Docker for suitability on, on the edge uh, as well. Uh, so I think serverless uh, is, is a big new thing coming up. Yeah. So, okay, we will invite you at next APIs conference in the next years to talk about, you know, Docker, Kubernetes, and then serverless as the big tool chain, right? Let's see what happens. Thank you Let's so much for, for inviting me and uh, for having hosting the presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, very much Eric. Again, for people who have more questions, you can uh, you will be able to find Eric on WSO2 booth.